The Eighth Revelation The pitiful suffering of Christ as he dies, his discoloured face and dried up body. It was after this that Christ showed me something of his passion near the time of his dying. I saw his dear face, dry, bloodless and pallid with death. It became more pale, deathly and lifeless. Then dead, it turned a blue colour, gradually changing to a browny blue as the flesh continued to die. For me, his passion was shown primarily through his blessed face and particularly by his lips. There too I saw these same four colours, though previously they had been, as I had seen, fresh, red and lovely. It was a sorry business to see him change as he progressively died. His nostrils too shriveled and dried up before my eyes, and his dear body became black and brown as it dried up in death. It was no longer its own fair living colour. For at the same time as our blessed Lord and Saviour was dying on the cross, there was in my picture of it a strong, dry and piercingly cold wind. Even when the precious blood was all drained from that dear body, there still remained a certain moisture in his flesh, as was shown me. The loss of blood and pain within, the gale and the cold without, met together in his dear body. Between them the four, two outside, two in, with the passage of time, dried up the flesh of Christ. The pain, sharp and bitter, lasted a very long time, and I could see it painfully drying up the natural vitality of his flesh. I saw his dear body gradually dry out, bit by bit, withering with dreadful suffering. And while there remained any natural vitality, so long he suffered pain. And it seemed to me that with all this drawn out pain, he had been a week in dying, dying and on the point of passing all that time he endured his final suffering. When I say it seemed to me that he had been a week in dying, I am only meaning that his dear body was so discoloured and dry, so shriveled, deathly and pitiful, that he might well have been seven nights in dying. And I thought to myself that the withering of his flesh was the severest part, as it was the last of all Christ's passion. I looked with all my might for the moment of his dying, and I thought I would have seen his body completely dead. But I did not see him thus. And just as I was thinking that his life was about to finish and that I must be shown his end, suddenly, while I gazed on the cross, his expression changed to cheerful joy. The change in his blessed countenance changed mine too, and I was as glad and happy as could be. Then our Lord put this thought in my mind. What point is there in your pain and grief now? And I was happy indeed. I understood him to mean that we, through our own pains and passion, and now dying with him on his cross, and that as we deliberately abide on that same cross, helped by his grace to the very end, suddenly his expression shall change, and we shall be with him in heaven. Between the one thing and the other, no time shall intervene, all shall be brought to joy. This is what he meant by this revelation. What point is there in your pain and grief now? We shall be blessed indeed. I saw perfectly clearly that if he was going to show us now his joy and gladness, there can be no pain, earthly or otherwise, that will trouble us, but that all things should bring joy and gladness. But because he shows it along with his cross and passion, as he had to endure it in his life, so we too must endure discomfort and hardship with him, as indeed our natural weakness necessitates. He suffers, 
because it is his will and goodness to raise us even higher in bliss. In exchange for the little that we have to suffer here, we shall have the supreme unending knowledge of God which we should never have without it. The sharper our suffering with him on his cross, the greater our glory with him in his kingdom.